This video is meant to be an introduction to integration by parts, or what we might call running the product rule for derivatives in reverse. So in this video, we're going to figure out how to reverse the product rule for derivatives. In other words, find antiderivatives involving products of functions. We're going to try a few examples, but we're not. We're going, we're going to save for another video uh, an examination of definite integrals using this method, and we're going to put off sort of a general strategy uh, for a later video. We'll talk about a few tips along the way, but, um, but this is meant to be just the very first notions of what it means to integrate products of functions. So a great example is what is the antiderivative of x cosine x? So we obviously know how to integrate x and we obviously know how to integrate cosine. So the question is, given the ability to integrate one or the other of a product, how might we integrate the product of two functions? So a, na a naive idea sort of pops into our head, you know, is it is it just possible that the integral of a product is the product of an integral? Well, if this is true, we should test drive it against sort of a case we understand very well. So for example, we could integrate x squared. And we know that x squared is x times x. So if this rule works, then we should be able to integrate x sort of twice and then multiply the results together. Now, on the one hand, we know that the antiderivative of x squared is actually one third x cubed. And on the other hand, we would, multi we would find the antiderivative of x to be one half x squared and multiply those two things together. And those don't look very much alike. And you can say, well, that's not fair. We should try some constants of integration. So really, we can pick a k for this side. And then we've got two constants of integration over here we can worry about and you would multiply these out and now the question is is there any way to choose constants k b and c so that these two functions are going to look the same and that's obviously false there's just no way to choose the constants of integration so that these two functions look the same because in fact the lead term is going to have a different degree for these two polynomials so that was not the way to integrate a product how are we going to figure out a product rule for antiderivatives? Well, what we should really do is look at the product rule for derivatives. So here it is. The derivative of fg is fg prime plus f prime g. And now what we're going to do is immediately take the antiderivative of both sides. And of course, if you take the derivative and then find the antiderivative, you'll come right back where you started. And on the right side, we're going to be a, bit, a little lazy and just slap an integral sign around the whole mess. So there you go fg should be equal to this indefinite integral on the right side, which, by the way, we can rewrite using the law of integrals that says the integral of a sum is the sum of the integral. So we get this formula right here, and now we're just going to use a little bit of algebra again to rework this. So the integral of fg prime is equal to fg minus the integral of g f prime. And believe it or not, this is our integration by parts formula. It looks uh, complicated, and you might wonder, you know, why is this useful? So let's take a look at the sort of internals here. What, what we can do with this formula is if, if you can factor the integrand into two parts and find the antiderivative of one of those parts, then you can rewrite the original integral in terms of a new integral over here. You'll notice this is a new integral, integral of g f prime. Now, why might you do this? Well, the new integral just might be easy to evaluate or at least easier to evaluate than the original one. Maybe it's more useful or maybe there's some other reason that you want to jiggle the integral around and try to find something else. But the point is that the integration by parts formula allows us to rewrite an integral of a product in terms of another integral where the product's been jiggled around a little bit and you get something new and hopefully something good comes out of that. So let's take a look at an example. In fact, the original example we had, the integral of x cosine x dx. So the first thing we're going to have to do is identify the parts. So in other words, we're going to have to see how this plays out in the template. So let's say we chose f of x to be x, and we're going to let g prime of x be cosine of x. And so now we take the derivative of f, and we take the antiderivative here to get g of x equals sine x, and now we go through and we see which functions are playing the role of which parts in our formula. And you swap those out carefully, and you will have your application of the integration by parts formula. So we're going to simplify the integral of sine x times 1. It was, of course, just the integral of sine x. 
So take a look at what the integration of parts formula has given us. The integral of x cosine x is now expressed as the product of x sine x minus the integral of sine x. And of course, this new integral, we understand. We know how to find the antiderivative. That's negative cosine x. So in the end, we get this formula for our antiderivative, plus, of course, our constant of integration. So integration by parts allows us to evaluate the product this way. Now let's check. We should make sure that, in fact, when we take the derivative of this, we recover the original integrand. So uh, integral, uh, integral of a sum is a sum of the integrals. The product formula is going to give us this term. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Derivative of a constant is zero. We get some cancellation. And lo and behold, we get x cosine x. And there you go. So the integration by parts formula really did do the job. Now, you could ask a very good question. What about other options? Because that wasn't the only way to identify parts. What if we had let f be cosine and g prime be x? Well. What if we had done that? Then we could take the derivative and antiderivative respectively, apply the parts formula. So we're going to take fg minus the integral of gf prime, putting in all those parts and simplifying a little bit gives us this. Now this formula is true. We have applied the integration by parts formula to come up with a relationship that is true. But if your intention had been to actually evaluate the, inter the original integral, this is actually a little bit problematic because this new integral is actually more complicated than the original integral because now you've got a quadratic times sine and the trouble there is sort of greater than the trouble we had to begin with if your goal was to evaluate the integral. So there are many ways to choose parts in a given integral often. So there are often many ways to choose parts in an integral and, and you sort of have to play around with the one that makes most sense for you. So here's our integration by parts formula, and that's all fine. But actually, I think what we should do is move towards a better version of this formula. We're going to use the formalism of differentials to simplify integration by parts. So imagine you have an integral, and you've recognized your parts inside. So f and a derivative of some function g. So you've recognized these parts. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to let u stand for f of x. And we're going to let the differential dv stand for the product g prime of x dx. We're going to let dv be that whole thing. Now, what you do next, having identified your parts, is you sort of take the differential. So du is f prime of x dx. And now you want to find a relationship here whose differential gives you dv equals g prime of x dx. And, and that should be pretty clear in this template. You want v to be g of x. Now, as a practical matter, if you can't figure out this anti-differential, then you got to rethink your choice of parts. This is the key obstacle to applying the integration by parts formula. You have to be able to find this anti-differential in the process to make it go forward. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck because the rest of your formula requires you to take the product of u, v, and then integrate v, du. And so there's your integration by parts formula. And if you let our new variables u, v, and their differentials stand in for the original, you get a very slick integration by parts formula that would fit nicely on a bumper sticker. So there's integral of u dv is equal to uv minus the integral of v du. So let's take a look at our example again in light of this new differential version of our parts formula. So we're going to let u be x and we're going to let dv be cosine x dx. Now we need to take the differential on the one side, and now we need to find the anti-differential on the other side. And this is the key piece. If you couldn't do this part, then you're not going to be able to move forward with integration by parts. But in fact, if dv is cosine x dx, then v equals sine x works. So now we apply the rest of our parts formula, uv minus the integral of v du. And that is exactly the relationship we obtained previously. So the integral of x cosine x is x sine x minus the integral of sine. That last integral is something we can actually evaluate. So integration by parts has actually allowed us to find the antiderivative. Let's talk for a minute about the mnemonics of uh, the parts formula when you use differentials. So I want to make the claim that knowing this version of the formula actually helps you 
remember the, the, and apply the parts formula itself. So you have some integral and you, you're vaguely aware of, you, you recall your integration by parts formula, you know that somehow you're gonna rewrite this integral as a, as a new function minus another integral. And you just can't remember exactly what goes where, but you also remember that somehow you can use u and v and their differentials, and somehow out of these vague fuzzy memories, you're going to reconstruct the parts formula. So just take a look at this template for a second. Something that has to be integrated, it's gotta be a product of something with a differential. It's gotta make sense as something you'd integrate. So you've got u du or v dv or u dv or v du. Those are the only sort of products of two things on this list that can be integrated. And of all those, the only sort of interesting ones are v du and u dv. Because obviously u du, actually you know how to integrate that. That's one half u squared for example. So u dv and v du are really your only viable candidates for interesting things to integrate. So pick one, let's say u dv. Now, of all the things you can take a product of, what are the, what's the only pair of things whose product is actually a freestanding function? It's just u and v, that's your only choice. So this guy here has gotta be u v. And now you're left with this other integral, it's obviously gotta be your other choice, so that's v du. And there's your integration by parts formula. There's a certain symmetry to this, a certain sort of uh, inevitability. If you, if you just think about the roles that all these different players have to play, you're almost guaranteed to remember the integration by parts formula. Now, you could say, wait a second, what if in the original choice I had chosen VDU to begin with, then I would get this parts formula. Is that correct? Well, Yes, of course it is, because you can take either one of these formulas and solve for this new relationship, which we might call the symmetrized parts formula. In other words, you can use the formula, whether you call the original thing UDV or VDU, if you apply your process, you'll get to a correct statement. So let's try a second example. Let's find the integral of x e to the negative 2x. So we'll let u be x and we'll let dv be e to the negative 2x dx. Now remember, u dv must account for all of the integrand. You, you haven't made your choice correctly if u times dv doesn't wind up giving you the whole thing. So you have to double check that, and in this case, we're okay. u dv is the entire integrand. So we can move on to the next step. du is equal to dx, and of course here's the key obstacle. If we couldn't do this next step, then we'd have to have a different choice of parts. But if dv is e to the negative 2x dx, we can anticipate what v should be, run the chain rule in reverse a little bit with a negative 1 half factor out front, so v equals negative 1 half e to the negative 2x. uv minus the integral of v du, you are literally swapping out your parts in this case into your template of the formula, and you get this which we can simplify a little bit. And now the good news is this second integral, we know how to find the antiderivative of e to the negative 2x. And there is our formula for the antiderivative that we originally were looking at. So integration by parts has saved the day here for us. And let's look at a final example, x ln of x. Once again, we have to choose u and dv to account for the whole integrand. So in this case, we'll take u to be ln of x, and we'll take dv to be x dx. du is 1 over x, and v is 1 half x squared. Now, uv minus the integral v du is this, and you'll notice there's some cancellation to be done in the integrand on the right, and we get something we can find the antiderivative of and we are good to go. We have figured out the antiderivative of x ln of x.